Sentinel Install Magazine. The topic for this broadcast will be about smart infrastructure and how it is going to evolve. However, without further ado, let me hand over to the host and moderator for this session, uh, our young looking Davy Curry there, uh, Managing Director of Infracor. Over to you, Davy. <laughs> Thanks, David. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our third edition of the EI Live Tech Tour. Tech Talk webinar series. My name is David Curry and I'm your host and moderator for the next 30 minutes. Um, quick bit of background on the EI Live Tech Talk series. Um, we're going to be doing 12 shows over 12 months. Uh, each show is going to be fronted by one of our recently assembled Digital Dozen, a team of the great and good from all corners of the industry. We're going to be talking about a whole bundle of different things under the umbrella of AV, integrated systems, smart homes, smart buildings, everything from smart cities to smart infrastructure, um, Wi-Fi to Li-Fi, and you know all sorts of different really interesting upcoming new technologies. So onto the panel for today, we've got Mark Laird from Lairds of Trun, director at Lairds of Trun. We've got Cliff Stammers, director at Clever Rooms, Ollie Morgan, director at Blend Technology Consultants, and delighted to be welcoming today our special guest, who is the executive director of the Z-Wave Alliance, Mr. Mitch Klein. Great. So um, today, uh, Mark Laird is going to be taking center stage. Mark has um, over 20 years experience in, in our industry. Um, Spent he's the beginning of his career actually in the army. Came out of the army, started an IT company, very successful IT company, and then moved into um, moved into custom install and, and been successfully operating that space for over ten years now. Um, Mark has a, a a degree, a master's degree in network security, so it was obviously very well placed to talk about infrastructure. Um, also recently um, gained accreditation with the Certified Network Cable Installer guys, so who better to talk to us about infrastructure than Mark? Mark, do you want to come in and give us your thoughts on smart infrastructure and how that's going to evolve? Yeah, uh, thanks very much, Davy. Uh, nice to meet everyone today. Um, the <coughs> technology sector uh, these days is full of big words fast moving timelines and continually evolving platforms and protocols and uh, today's word the infrastructure is vitally important um, but how can one word describe uh, something that's made up of so many changing but vitally important components and um, the other word is interoperable systems capable of working in harmony transacting with each other without latency uh, or any discernible handoff issues. Both big words, both vitally important aspects of any smart system, uh, smart infrastructure that supports that. Today's infrastructure aspires to be, um, for want of a better word, um, as fluid as the human body. Um, it's a great analogy. Multiple systems working for the global or singular good, safety of the unit, um, the senses transmitting those signals through self-healing channels and they're, they're fully controlled and managed, analysed at every point. The support and facilities make sure that the unit can function as intended for the duration of its life, with the instant ability to detect and defend itself from adversaries, viruses, that kind of thing, um, and the ability to regenerate damaged or destroyed sections without interruption in the overproduction. Um, Today's technologies for the home user, cloud, mobile, internet of things, they're all combining to transform networks. Um, today's networks are, uh, they've got more devices than users than the enterprise networks of yesteryear. Um, in fact, the, the number of addresses in a network, um, they're almost limitless. We're now faced with the challenge of providing a smart infrastructure to support connectivity to places, things, people, um, while ensuring visibility and security and the control that is absolutely essential. It's been, it has to be done affordably and without disruption. Um, the customer wants to see seamless interaction with everything. Um, the new technology and re uh, reality 
uh, of people, places and things, networks and the infrastructure in which they sit, uh, it has to scale to entirely new levels. Um, automation will be essential, not just for the, the services in the home, but it will have to enable the configuration and operation of networks without huge increases in complexity and cost. And security is absolutely essential as well. It's not, in uh, today's world, uh, an afterthought. Fair to say, today's age and infrastructure is um, inefficient, inflexible, can't adapt quick enough. Current technologies, um, fibre to the cabinet, cable, ADSL, satellite 4G, and the providers, BT, Virgin, uh, amongst some, um, they've all got limitations and there's loads of equipment, loads of people, loads of skills in between um, that all slow down and hamper the process of evolution. Uh, emerging technologies, IP6, narrowband IoT, fibre to the device and 5G, they look like they have huge potential, uh, but we need to carefully consider how best to adopt them and include them in our projects. Z-Wave is a technology alliance that has the power to transform the, the landscape. Uh, I'll leave that for Mitch to expand on. It's my belief that the future of smart technology and infrastructure networks like the human body must be self-aware, self-healing, um, legacy networks experience reliability issues, especially if equipment's nearing the end of its life cycle. Traditional infrastructure deployment and uh, architectures, uh, they're not created to support these new emerging ecosystems and can't provide the security required. Um, most data was destined for a central hub or a, a, a central server or center. Um, but now we're looking at cloud-based locations, virtual networks, that kind of thing. Users are demanding seamless, secure access from anywhere in the world be it a laptop or a smartphone, um, and it's a kind of a, a perimeterless approach. It's my belief that the infrastructure now and of the future needs to be secure, reliable, capable of scale and interoperable. Alliances which are open and encourage companies to work together in the pursuit of seamless customer experience, provided by all the tech companies along with smaller disruptive businesses like ourselves, uh, will allow us all as technology professionals to provide the systems that we need for our customers now and in the future. In order for that smart infrastructure of the future to be as we think it can be, uh, the idea of alliances is, isn't just a fanciful thing, it's absolutely necessary uh, to reach the potential of the smart technology that we will require in the future. Well, it's a lot. It's a lot to take in, Mark. It's a, it's a huge subject sure. again. You know, we, we we tackle we tackle some some big subjects here at the EI Live um, platform. So very very well put. Obviously, we need to we need to be coming together uh, on this type of thing. Otherwise, we're all doing our own thing. You know, and how do we how do we how do we know that we're we're designing this these smart the, the smart infrastructure upon which everything else sits? How do we know we're getting that right? Um, Obviously, we're looking at standards and, and standardising, which leads us very nicely into our, our special guest for today. Um, over 30 years experience in the industry, um, could say a, a founding father or one of the founding fathers of the custom install space. Um, recently recognised for his services to the industry, picking up the CDA Lifetime Achievement Award last year. Um, Mitch, lovely to have you. What do, what do you think of all this? Where, where is smart infrastructure going? What can you pick out of what, what Mark said already? Love to hear your wow. thoughts. Uh, Mark has got a lot of valid points, and I think the bottom line is it's confusing now. And the good news is that's not going to change for some time. It's going to continue to be confusing. So mm -hmm. interestingly enough, you know, I, I started my career and spent much of it pulling wires and making sure the proper wires got pulled. Uh, and obviously the requirements changed over the years in terms of what type of wired infrastructure is necessary but i can definitely say wires are still not just relevant but essential in the home when we talk about things like networks and so on and so forth i'm sure 
if we sat in a room and I said, okay, everyone who's happy with the Wi-Fi coverage in your home, raise your hand, you know, the hands would go up for those who are technically, uh, technically adept, but everyone else would go, no, it kind of sucks in my house. So, you know, wired is, is still going to be a thing. It's still essential. You talked about even fiber to the, to the cabinet, to the rack. Uh, I don't know whether or not that's going to be a real thing. But the irony is I've gone from uh, running wires to living in the wireless world. So as important as it is to get your infrastructure within the home as wired as possible and connected as possible, wireless is really the future because let's face it, we're not going to be running wires from our watches uh, or from our cars or from our clothing, right, to the home. That's also going to be wireless. And to say there will be one winning or a couple of winning wireless technologies would be incorrect. It can't be because each of the wireless standards that are out there have their strengths. And uh, I think that we're going to be just, uh, let's say, jousting with that for some time. Mark, you mentioned things like uh, NB-IoT. You can throw in 5G. You can add LoRa. You can add in uh, any number of those technologies. But those are really not designed for the home or inside the home. They're great for smart cities, which is obviously beyond the uh, conversation we're going to have today. But within the home, you know, we've been working with things like Wi-Fi, with uh, Zigbee, with Z-Wave, and now more and more with Bluetooth. And of course, you've probably heard of the uh, latest uh, one to come out, which we're calling CHIP, which is the Connected Home Over IP, which is uh, essentially a spinoff from the Zigbee team, which brought in, uh, let's see, Google, Amazon, Apple, as well as many other influential companies to say, you know what? We have so many different standards out there. We're going to fix it. We're going to create another standard. Uh, you know, we've seen the cartoons for that many times over. And whether or not chip is successful, we'll see. But let's add that to the to the uh, uh, to the mixed soup of technologies. Personally, I prefer Z-Wave. You can see that's my title. Um, but just to kind of set the record straight, um, we launched Z-Wave as an independent standards organization only really within the last couple of weeks. Um, and my role at Z-Wave as executive director continues, but I, as a volunteer executive director, and I'm actually really representing Silicon Labs, who uh, obviously has interests in every one of those technologies that I mentioned just previously. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's, that's kind of the quick overview. Uh, Z-Wave, as you know, has the largest ecosystem out there and has a mandate for interoperability and is really one of the better platforms for all of you integrators. And that's simply because you get to choose from over 3,300 products that will interoperate. You get to use your expertise to determine which is the right door lock, you know, what are the right lighting devices, which is a thermostat, how am I going to control my temperature? And you have a much wider range of resources available. Uh, so I'll leave it at that and see if you've got any other questions we want to talk about. Yeah, it's it's really interesting stuff, Mitch. Um, I, I you know I, I think it, it it's quite a, it can be quite a confusing space with all the different protocols and different ways of connecting and everything else. Um, and it's interesting to hear you say that obviously there's there's the cable is not dead, and there's, 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 there's still yeah it still has its place. And I think f for me having having you know, come from that similar background to yours and that I run um, uh, an install company, trying to understand all the different options and make sure that we're designing the infrastructure, which allows for some sort of future proofing. If we can even, you know, it's not a word I like to use, future proofing. I think it's, um, it's probably not possible to future proof something. But how, how do we, how do we um, best approach the design of the infrastructure with so many different options and, and protocols? And how can we ensure that we're, we're getting it right? And how do we, how can we sort of standardize that from a, a sort of design point of view to make sure that we're giving our clients the right thing? First of all, I I agree. I would not use future proof. I used to use the term future resistant. You know, in in the U.S., that's the legal term when you want to say something's waterproof. You say it's water resistant, and then that way, if it leaks, you said, yes, yeah, see, I only said it was resistant. Um, so anyway, future resistant wiring in the home. Uh, 
we can definitely look back at some of the houses I wired 10, 15 years ago and say, hey, we did the right thing. Um, needless to say, you can't possibly know what's going to happen in the next 15 years or so. But my suggestion would be not much will change in the terms of wiring. But what will change is the ability of wireless to communicate in greater distances, to yeah. transmit better through construction materials, uh, and to become interoperable. And I know Mark, you use that term, uh, become more interoperable with other uh, other wireless technologies. We are moving in those directions. Um, yeah. We are looking at long range technologies. So yeah, we're, we're moving there right now. It's interesting you say um, sort of the pitching on construction as well. I know that Ollie works very closely with a, a number of different developers. Um, the big developers, obviously, um, Ollie's company operate globally and very much sort of on, on the client side. Ollie, how do you trade off between when, when you're sitting down to do the network or the infrastructure design? How do you trade off between um, wireless solutions versus versus wired for a, a, a typical resi MDU or, or big commercial install? How would you normally tackle that? So initially, there's an element of education needed for bringing a developer up to speed. Um, there was definitely a tendency sort of 10 years ago where, no offense to everyone on the panel, but integrators were maybe in the resi sector advising developers on what they needed to put in. And they put in far too much, in my opinion, whether it's infrastructure or the bells and whistles on the end. And I think the developers have, have, were smarting a bit from that. And for the last five, six years, have wanted to look at it again and they've almost come at it from the opposite angle they were really trying to reduce what they were putting in on day one and there's there's a balance there's something in between needed um but also you've got to cater for all the different types of purchases of apartments in an mdu scheme some are going to be very technical want the rack in the closet um and all singing all dancing system and others will you know, be looking for a simple wireless solution whether it's sonos or a bit of home automation um, so we try to sort of educate the developer, bring them up to speed on what the options are, where the market's at, what competitors are doing, um, and then design the infrastructure for both sort of end users, whether it's a technical purchaser who wants that rack or whether it's a it's much simpler uh, requirement. Um, you know, we're still, you know, the, I guess that what's been paired back is maybe speaker cabling. Developers are now just sort of saying, well, look, we're not going to put that in. Nobody's putting speakers in. And if they do, it causes problems with noise transfer. And there's all these great wireless solutions, which aren't a solution for everyone. But uh, there's been a lot of pressure from developers on that front. So speaker cabling's tended to be omitted. But we're still running in you know, Cat6, Cat6A. Um, and the home automation, whether it's a bit of lighting control, um, access control, what have you, that's sometimes just their independent systems, but the infrastructure's there if it needs to be tied together and somebody wants to add in a, a full home automation system on top of that. Yeah, yeah. Cliff, you're um, you're out and about a lot. You're very much at the cold phase, you know, doing doing the programming side of things. You come in at the end, really. You come in after we've all all done our bit and, and make make it work. What sort of trends are you seeing in way of, of sort of infrastructure design? You know, you do you do a lot, you do, you know single dwelling, private resi, multi-dwelling stuff, commercial stuff, super yachts, yeah. all that sort of stuff. You know, infrastructure, what, what you're seeing more and more recently? To be honest, Davey, it's, uh, it's the wireless infrastructure is, is key. That is nothing's, nothing's changed too much. I mean, people, it's just, the, it's bandwidth from my perspective, because I'm transferring software across the network. So it's about what we can send. Now we're doing video over IP and things of that nature. You need more and more bandwidth. And, and, and that's the way it's going. Actually, in terms of infrastructure, it's not changed a great deal really for quite some time you know when wi-fi hit 15 years ago and everyone moved across to that that's where that's where we're still at in a lot of places but i i, I was very intrigued by what ollie just said because it is to my mind about accreditation because we do need to educate the installers and we do need to keep people on their toes and i would like to ask mitch even what the z-wave alliance is doing to bolster accreditation in the states is that something that you guys are focusing on it must be a part of your your program i should think uh yes of course it is um as a as an alliance we really don't have the ability to uh educate consumers to the extent they need to be educated um you know our focus really has to be 
on the manufacturing side and helping our manufacturer partners to get the word out there. So. But through Cedia, Mitch, is that something that they're promoting more and more heavily? I know they've always had these classes at the, at the exhibitions and so on and so forth. Is that more Absolutely. prevalent? Yeah. It is. Yeah. And Cedia has been doing a lot of outreach to different trades. You know, they've gotten involved in builder shows, um, in design designer shows. So, yeah, we're making good progress with that. Yeah, um, interesting. Ali, you mentioned something about, about how the developers are doing less and less wiring for speakers. And I think uh, one of the good arguments for them to actually use the wiring for speakers is to show the limited uh, options you have for wireless and how wireless speakers don't necessarily integrate very nicely in well-designed spaces, to put it politely, right? So yeah, anyway, can go absolutely. Uh, absolutely. my point is you still need a power supply for a wireless speaker. So if you're going to put a plug socket in, why yeah, not yeah. put a discrete speaker Mark. cable? There's nothing wireless about wireless. I got it. Mark. Well, as part of a, a, a the, the infrastructure, uh, and as you said, Mitch, it's, it's always going to be a requirement for wires. Um, wires are going to move to different types of materials like glass or whatever. Um, but you've also got this uh, parallel timeline with uh, the environment. So you've got people that are building houses that are literally lined with tinfoil, you know? So you've got your Kingspan or whatever the, the, the kind of American equivalent is, where it's, it's a kind of high density board with tinfoil on either side for your uh, insulation, soundproof and that kind of thing. Um, then you've also got uh, water tanks and water pipes and things like that. All of these are obviously having um, pretty dire consequences for wireless transmission and um, so with the with the, the the kind of topic of infrastructure we've all got our places um, and I think is the, is the Z wave Alliance and uh, the, their kind of partners thinking about um, mediums that are going to help with that kind of transmission does that make sense through different areas and with the, with the environment in mind, the way the houses are getting built. Yeah, I, I would have to say absolutely. Uh, there are some announcements coming forward in terms of further specification improvements for, for, for Z-Wave or Z-Wave, as you like to say. Um, <laughs> again, to, to extend its range to be able to increase the power, absolutely. And some of the things that we have coming out, uh, we're actually making an announcement uh, in about two weeks at an event called the Works With event that Silicon Labs is putting on. I can talk about that in a moment if you want. And the announcement essentially is going to be about how, how uh, Z-Wave has a, a new specification with the ability to transmit at least four times further than previous. And even if the physical length isn't necessarily applicable in some construction materials, I know in UK you've got different type of masonry, concrete, bricks, etc. Um, just the extra strength helps it to move between some of those rooms, which are divided by uh, different working materials. So, now, to me, that's fascinating. That's sorry, Mitch, I've jumped in, but that's fast, that's very interesting. So, so, so Z-Wave is it? You're saying it's stronger than Wi-Fi? It's gonna, it, it'll go. It, it'll carry more bandwidth already at the moment. So, okay, there's there's two answers to to that question. Uh, number one is that Z-Wave Z-Wave always has had better transmission distance from Wi-Fi. And that's simply because the physics of sub gigahertz versus 2.4 or five gigahertz. That's a physics thing. You can't make claims around it. The, the fact is sub gig will work better in the home. In terms of bandwidth, well, Wi-Fi has got the ability for greater bandwidth. So this is, again, gets back to what I was talking about earlier, is no one technology is gonna solve all the problems. Uh, we're gonna use Z-Wave for control and for communication back and forth. But for heavy, heavy data devices yeah. like yeah. Uh, video, you're yeah. going to use Wi-Fi. You're not going to use Z-Wave for that. So there's going to be a partnership of some sort. Yes, yeah. exactly. I think, I think we're getting into the overall sort of ecosystem. And it's it's um it's interesting to hear again this idea of of different things all coming together and and and, and Z-Wave, for example, not being the answer. You know, or being claiming to be all things to all men. 
but I think you know with that in mind, with all the different technologies and all the competing um, places, how do we? Do you think we'll see someone stepping in and taking control of the overall and and, and developing a standard for that? Is that even achievable? Is that a well, job for Syria? Would Syria be pos Would Syria be capable of, of of undertaking such a task? Uh, okay, so again, I got a couple of, couple of responses to that. Let's just talk about the Cedia thing. Um, I don't see Cedia being able to solve that problem simply because the market is much, much, much bigger by uh, logarithmic means uh, than Cedia can address. Cedia can help influence individual manufacturers in terms of their adaptation, but in terms of the actual technology itself, understand that when you're developing uh, a device, a, a platform, Z-Wave, you're developing chip. You know, you're looking at being able to move millions of devices per month, if not per year. Uh, CD is not going to be able to impl influence that. But what CD can influence, again, is the manufacturers to say, hey, we need you to be more interoperable. Don't just give me an API. An API to me is a manufacturer saying, you do the work. You know, I'm not going to do it. You do it. And and the you yeah. do it, hey, Cliff, to you, you know, that's awesome for you and, and the programming side, but it just gives you headache after headache when yeah. uh, something in the platform changes and you know, the you know, you have to go back to the API and fix hundreds of your customers' systems, right? Um, yeah. So anyway, I forgot the first part. <laughs> Sorry, the first part of the question. Do you know what, Mitch? Actually, before we um before we, we run out of time, do you want to tell us a wee bit more about the, the Silicon Labs thing, the, the working with? Oh, yes. Uh, and actually, you're all invited to to join up. Um, we Because we provide silicon, and, and the silicon is actually the single most important part in any product, because the silicon is where all of the stuff that, that communicates happens, right? It all happens at the chip level. So whether that's a Z-Wave chip or a Zigbee chip or, or any of these. So there are big brands, you know, Amazon with what they've got. you got Google, SmartThings uh, with Samsung. Comcast in the US and uh, uh, others in, in Europe, that as a developer, where do I go? How do I develop? How do I make a product that works with Amazon's ecosystem or what have you? So we had this uh, event put together for a live event in person, I should say, which of course we know no one's doing that anymore. It's moved to virtual. You're all invited. It's called Works With. You can actually go to workswith.scilabs.com. And we've got, uh, I want to say, over 41 different educational sessions, including panels that you guys might be interested in that might be very relevant. Um, so, again, whether you're a developer or you just simply want to see what's going on, because mm -hmm. the things that we're talking about today will impact products that you're going to buy maybe in a year to two years from now. Fantastic. So we'll definitely um, we'll definitely check that out, and that's I'm sure that's really useful for everyone who's tuned in yeah. today. Um, and we'll get that, David. I'm sure you'll follow up with that and get the get the links out on on social, etc. Yep. So, guys, listen, we're going to um, we're, we're going to start um, move, move into some Q and A. We've got a few questions lined up that we received ahead of time by our social media platforms, and I think up first we've got Chris. Chris, are you there? You want to share your camera with us? I think you've got a, a question for Mitch. Oh, yeah. Chris. Yeah, hi Mitch. Um, so um, I think sometimes installers are dazzled by all these kind of new technologies, um, but they obviously need to plan for the future to be as future-proof as possible. Uh, what's your advice on how this can be achieved? And do you think also that wireless is going to replace, fully replace wired? Okay, so the last half of it, will wireless fully replace wired? No. No, I don't see that ever happening, but I do see wireless taking a bigger piece of that that uh, infrastructure, and you will definitely see that. So when your customers pull into their garage with their car, there's some type of a handshake that goes on that's going to be wireless in terms of what happens. Um, and that's the same thing with, with uh, devices that people will wear or whether it's clothing, et cetera. So, that's that's all coming coming up in the future. Uh, as far as how does an integrator stay up on top of it, I think a great option is to really kind of join up and participate at the CEDIA level. Uh, CEDIA is a global organization, and there's some really smart 
talented people who are constantly working to keep members aware of what's going on. Um, also take some time each day and maybe read through some technology uh, magazines that are coming out. But in terms of being future proof, get the right wires in the right place and be very clear to your customers how quickly things are changing because you know, let's, uh, I said kind of jokingly early on, you know, one of the curses we have is that we're always learning something, but that's also a benefit. You know, there's always something new coming out. So you're gonna have to keep your eyes and ears open and again, CD is a good place to get started. Brilliant, that's absolutely, awesome. thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for that, Mitch. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's a, again a, another interesting one. I think it's um, this idea of future proofing, um, Mitch. I like I like your term, um, future resistant. That that um, that resonates a lot more. And I think you know, just thinking about redundancy, and it also is reassuring to to hear that you know you, you're not having to jump into one camp or the other, and it's very much about a sort of almost hybrid sort of solution stroke design for the infrastructure and that's something that we're always going to have you know the trade-off between or the, the coming together of wired and wireless uh, David we've got some questions that have come in on the on the chat can you pick something out and perhaps put something to Cliff please yes indeed um, this is coming from uh, Ian in Sussex uh, is wireless viable for high-res transfer in the future do you think we'll get this reliable is it viable for, sorry, David, repeat that. Is wireless viable for high res transfer in the future? Uh, yeah. Do you, do you think we'll get reliable? Well, again, it's all about bandwidth, isn't it? I'm sorry to sort of be boring on that because uh, is, it, is it reliable? Is the bandwidth there? I mean, it depends what people want to do. Um, I, I, all the development's going to take uh, place in that, in that arena as far as I'm concerned, on, on wireless networks, and in fact on wired networks too. We just need to be transferring more and more information more and more quickly. And when 5G lands, the wired systems that we know and love are going to have to up their game even more. So I think it is all about you know, uh, expanding on that capability in the future. So uh, yes, I think it will expand. I think you're you're also looking for to take a sort of belt and braces approach, aren't you? And it's a sort of old school almost mentality of if you have the opportunity to throw the cables in, then do that. And at least you have that as a, a sort of starting point. Um, yeah. I think we've got, we got another question which we've, we've been sent in um, prior to today. I think we've got Dan. Dan's on. Dan, can you share our, your video with us? And I think you've got a question for Ollie. Hi, Dan. Hi, Davey. Uh, hi, Dan. Yeah, hi. Uh, this is a question for Ollie. Um, we heard um, Mitch talk about the CHRP. Um, initiative earlier, and um, my question is really: Do you think that um, how important do you think open standards are in the future to infrastructure design and implementation? And actually, do you think it's feasible to uh, kind of conceive of these big companies actually participating in a totally in, in a truly open standard rather than a kind of a, a, a marketing kind of open standard, and a kind of a partial open standard? <laughs> So I think designing infrastructure for open standards um, is a challenge, but it's achievable. Um, I think it's it's taking those decisions are you know so whether you're going to go down an infrastructure to support open standards or whether you're going to put some infrastructure in for proprietary systems, and that's really a decision taken early in the design phase with the client, the developer, whoever's involved. So. You know, it might be they want to go down the KNX route. Well, that's a different set of infrastructure um, to thermostats, lighting control, um, to what you might put in if you're going to go open standards or wireless. Um, pulling all those manufacturers into an open standards uh, platform, I'm quite sceptical on that front. I don't think it's um, you're going to get everyone on board. Um, but I think what you're aiming for is that you'll get a number of key players and, and life suddenly becomes a lot easier in terms of design and use of such systems. Yeah, I think you're yeah, right, it's a, it's, a, it's a number of key players, isn't it? And it's almost sort of like, I don't know, place your bets <laughs> a little bit, you know, when, when you're taking on these designs. It's a really tough one. Um, I don't know what the answer is. Um, it's a it's a it's a big thing to cover, obviously. Uh, David, more questions from from the chat. Have you can you pick something out and maybe stick one last question over to Mark, please? Yes, this is uh, uh, one coming from John from Bedfordshire. Short and sweet. 
Mark, could we plan fibre in projects now? Absolutely. Um, and I think to the extent where, um, and I think it'll be in the very near future, it'll be fibre to the device. If you can imagine you have fibre coming to a cabinet in the street, last section's copper, that kind of causes a bit of problems for some people, other people not. Um, but having fibre in the house and then having fibre all the way to a device, I think that's exactly where the industry is going to go. If you can understand the amount of data that's just coming in through Netflix, for example, and now we've got 8K TVs coming out, massive screens and so on. Um, I think having fibre alongside your uh, Cat 6 and Cat 6A is just the right thing to do. Yeah, it, it's funny, man. I think there's a sort of misconception as well, and particularly for um, the types of developers that, that perhaps Ollie's um, referring to um, and some of the guys I've worked with previously, there's a misconception that to put in some fibre as your sort of redu for redundancy as part of your redundant infrastructure is hugely expensive. And it's not from a first fix point of view, it's actually not expensive at all. And I think that's a misconception that we should we should do something yeah, about. Um, and come back, I mean, it, it, you can have the, the fibre at a very minimal cost, just sitting waiting. As long exactly. as you, you can have somebody come in at a later date and join in the dots. And if you think yeah, about okay. an enterprise level network, the backbones are always fibre. Yeah, you know. So I, I, I think that that's a key point to highlight. And as I say, it's a, it's a, it's a common misconception. The spend is not in the first fix. The spend is, to be fair, the spend is in the, the terminating, the splicing, the testing, and the plugging bits into it. <laughs> So from a from a, a smart infrastructure point of view, it's definitely the way to go, and I think it's something we need to perhaps sort of, you know, be more obvious about. But listen, guys, we've run out of time, um, unfortunately today. Um, but what what a, what a fantastic conversation, guys! Thank, thanks everyone for for tuning in. Thanks to the panelists today. Thanks, Mark, Cliff, Ollie. Thank you so much, Mitch, for for giving us your time. Um, fantastic, guys. Um, we're doing it all again this this time next month. I think we're we're doing the next one on the oh, on the eighth of October, and um, we're going to be talking about the changing face of all things lighting. Uh, and fronting up for this next episode, we've got Guy Singleton, who's the founder and MD of the Lighting Designer, uh, supporting Guy. We've got Neil Davidson from Genesis Technologies and Alan White from the Holborn Group. So until then, guys, onwards and upwards. Bye for now. <laughs>